Fractal design cases have inspired modders all over the world who have built some amazing systems like this dark side themed case by George Priscellus showcasing the spacious internals in the Define S, or Metallic Acid, a mini ITX system by Justin Olson featuring a white, black, and red color scheme and a super clean layout in the Define Nano S. There are a ton more awesome builds like these on Fractal Design's modding series page, so check it out via the sponsor link in this video's description and get inspired for your next project. Excellent! Ladies and gentlemen, today Intel hath launched upon us their 8th gen core series of desktop CPUs, aka Coffee Lake, refreshing and updating their mainstream lineup with new Z370 motherboards, and yes, you do need a 300 series chipset motherboard for compatibility with these new Coffee Lake CPUs. Today I have the flagship 6 core, 12 thread, Core i7-8700K, as well as the mid-range 6-core, six 6-thread six i5-8400. I suppose there are two ways to view this launch. You might say that Intel, the leader in CPU technology who has done and continues to do wonderful things for their customers, has bestowed upon us increased core counts and higher frequencies with this new platform at prices that are affordable to PC builders everywhere. Or maybe Intel, the once fallen champion of CPUs, beleaguered by AMD's relentless onslaught of launches in 2017 from Ryzen to Threadripper, seeing their market share shrink, had no choice but to fight back with a rushed to market launch of a platform that once again forces their mainstream users to buy a new motherboard despite the advent of six core processors. Personally though, I like to let the numbers speak for themselves, so the benchmarks will be my focus today as I pit the 8700K and 8400 against Intel's previous mainstream flagship, the 4-core 8-thread 7700K, as well as AMD's Ryzen 7 1800X with 8 cores and 16 threads, and AMD's Ryzen 5 1600X with 6 cores and 12 threads. Now apart from the Z370 chipset, which has the exact same features as Z270, there's a small stack of CPUs coming out today with a broader lineup promised in Q1 2018. At the bottom of the stack, you have the Intel Core i3-8100, a 4-core, four 4-thread four CPU with no hyper-threading or turbo boost. 3.6GHz base clock is all you get, and 65W TDP. This has dual-channel DDR4, just like all of the CPUs in the stack, but it will retail for just above $117. Bear in mind the prices here are all prices for buying 1,000 CPUs at once, bulk pricing, so expect retail prices to be maybe $20 to $30 more than this. Next up is the Core i3-8350K, still no turbo boost or hyper threading, but who cares, because it's unlocked for overclocking, but it is more than $50 more expensive than its sibling, the 8100, so that's a pretty big jump, but I guess it's kind of what they had to do to keep it competitive with their own other processors. I don't know, but 91 watt TDP and six megs of cash on this one. Next is the i5-8400 that I'll be testing today, 2.8 gigahertz base and a four gigahertz boost, six cores and six threads, 65 watt TDP, and $182 retail pricing, so I'm expecting this one to be around $200. The i5-8600K is the unlocked 6-core quad-core with no hyper-threading again, so 6 cores and 6 threads, 95 watt TDP. I'm expecting this to be a popular chip. $257 is the bulk price for that one. Next is the i7-8700K. Here with the i7s, you get hyper-threading, so 6 cores and 12 threads, only a 65 watt TDP on this one, and a 4.6 gigahertz boost. So this one might be a very viable option for those of you who aren't looking to overclock. And finally at the top, the i7-8700K, 3.7 gigahertz based, 4.7 gigahertz boost, 6 cores, 12 threads, 95 watt TDP, 12 megs of cash, and $359, so I'm expecting this one to be probably closer to 400. Now one thing I did notice about these CPUs are they do of course have variable clock speed. So the 8700K for example was idling at 800 megahertz which led to some uh, pretty decent power draw numbers but I'll come back to those after we do the benchmarks. On all cores when under a full load it was going at 4.3 gigahertz and when it was using some cores but not all it would be about 4.4 to 4.6 gigahertz and then the peak boost on a single core was 4.7 gigahertz. As for the rest of the test bed, of course I had to use a motherboard, so for that I have the Gigabyte's Aorus Z370 Ultra Gaming, a mid-range motherboard, so a very reasonable price and a nice feature set going along with it. Uh, for all the memory, I'm using G-Skill DDR4 kits and 2 by 8 gig configurations, all running at cast latency 14, 14, 14, 14, 34 to be specific, and DDR4 3200 speed. That gave me the exact same memory configuration and speed across all of my test beds. I of course had to make sure that all my BIOS and UEFIs are up to date running the F5 version on the Z370 Ultra Gaming here, running the latest NVIDIA drivers for the uh, GTX 1080 Ti Strix Ultra Gaming from ASUS that I was using as the GPU for all of the gaming tests. 
And then for cooling on the Intel and the AMD platforms, I'm using the NZXT Kraken X62. Moving into the benchmarks proper though, first off with Cinebench, of course, tested in uh, multi-thread configuration. We can see, of course, more cores and more threads is gonna give you a better score. So the 1800X comes out on top here with its eight cores and 16 threads. 8700K showing it's got the chops uh, with six cores and 12 threads though, scoring 1430 and beating out the 1600X that also has six cores and 12 threads. There you're seeing the single core advantage for Intel CPUs, which they already had with Kaby Lake, so no surprise that they are continuing to have with Coffee Lake. Next is a single threaded test, and here we can see the 8700K takes the win over the 7700K scoring 203, just a, just a smidgen faster, and that's most likely just due to the clock speed since it is running at about 4.7 versus 4.5 gigahertz. Moving on to CPU Mark, which is part of Passmark's performance tests and runs a bunch of different tests, testing different softwares and different parts of the CPU's architecture. And here we actually saw the uh, single core advantage giving the 8700K the lead with the score of 16,287, even though it only has 12 threads versus the 1800X with 16 threads. Uh, let's see if that carries out further on in the testing as well. In the single threaded test with CPU Mark, we saw the 8700K score a new all time high, 2,717, at least uh, when I don't include overclocking, beating out the 7700K's 2,627. And here we can see the Ryzen CPUs lagging behind with scores just over 2,000. Moving on to Blender, a very popular 3D modeling and rendering software. This is time in seconds, so bear in mind that a lower score is better here, and that means that the 8700K wins yet again, uh, beating out the 1800X by about three seconds. So uh, that is showing its advantage. This is a shorter test though. So let's switch over to the Blender BMW 27 test, which takes a bit longer. And here we can actually see the 1800X taking the lead with uh, only 296 seconds elapsed. Just barely though, with the 8700K coming in with 303 seconds. I also wanna point out here the 1600X, which is a comparable in price to the i5-8400 and the thread advantage that it has with all 12 threads versus the 8400 with only six definitely helps it take the lead here by a pretty significant margin. Switching gears to some gaming tests, and these are synthetic, so they do also have some CPU specific scores. 3D Mark Fire Strike Ultra shows overall scores that are all comparable to each other because when it comes down to it, your CPU's performance will often have less of an impact on the overall gaming performance than your GPU. However, we do have physics tests involved here as well, and physics is uh, primarily gonna tax the CPU. 1800X was not quite able to beat out the 8700K here, coming in with 19,370, whereas the 8700K comes in just ahead, 19,398. Moving on to 3D Mark Time Spy, a similar test to 3D Mark Fire Strike Ultra, except it's DirectX 12 now instead of DirectX 11. Uh, the scores are all kind of similar here, again, in the same sort of general ballpark, although we do seem to have an advantage when we have more cores and more threads because the 8700K and 1800X are both leading the pack here. You might notice when you look at graphics though that the scores are very similar, just indicating that uh, the CPU doesn't really have much effect on the GPU's performance, strictly speaking, but the CPU test does give the 1800X the lead once again. I did want to introduce some VR testing. So 3D Mark VR Mark Blue Room is a very difficult test to beat, actually. It's looking for 90 FPS and it's really challenging to get that at all. However, we didn't see much variance here uh, uh, between the different CPUs and different platforms being tested. So that leads me to believe that this test is not using more than probably six uh, threads at a time. And it's also probably much more GPU bound than CPU bound. Moving over to some actual games and starting with Rise of the Tomb Raider in DirectX 12 mode. Here at 1080, we actually saw a pretty decent skew when it comes to the performance of the different platforms with the 8700K definitely taking a pretty significant lead at 160 frames per second. 8400 comes in a bit slower at 145 with the 1800X and 1600X coming in much closer to about 120. So that does show an advantage for the 8700K. However, you'll see that this is much more evident at 1080. Whereas when you move up to higher resolutions such as 1440 and 2160, well 1440 for sure, we're only all at around the 110 to 115 frames per second mark with no clear leader. Although you might look at those minimum frame rate numbers and say, well, the 8700K does seem to be keeping up a little bit better and keeping those annoying low frame rate moments from happening. So that is something to consider as well. When we jump up to 2160 though, we again see a similar pattern. And here for some reason, our Ryzen CPUs jump ahead and take the lead, getting just a little bit faster at 61 frames per second. 
All of the minimum frame rates are roughly in the same ballpark. One more DirectX 12 test with Civilization 6, and here is one of those weird tests where the uh, resolution doesn't seem to matter all that much. Civ 6 doesn't really care what resolution you're running at. It cares a little bit more about the uh, clock speed of your CPU though, if that's in any indication with the 8700K taking the lead here again with 85.9 frames per second at 1080 at least. 1600X and 1800X are pretty close behind though with about 83 FPS. At 1440, we see similar scores with the 8700K and 1800X. Uh, 1600X starting to lag behind just a little bit. 8400, I don't really know why, but uh, came in pretty low here with a score of just shy of 75 frames per second. And then if we move over to 4K, we see higher frame rates in some tests. I, 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 I don't know, Civ 6, go home Civ 6, you're, you're drunk. But again, the 8400, that was one, the one thing that was consistent this entire time, was the 8400 with its only six threads available to it, scored lower than the rest of the test. So maybe Civ 6 is more optimized for eight threads or more. Let's switch over to DirectX 11, starting with Total War Warhammer 2, a fairly new title and a new addition to my test bench suite. And as excited as I was to get this test underway, it really hasn't shown much variance between any of these platforms at all. This is clearly not a CPU bound game because at 1080, we scored just about 115 FPS everywhere with roughly the same 0.1% lows. 1440, again, about 81 FPS, no matter what CPU I have this paired up with and 0.1% lows all around 70. And at 4K, we have about 44 to 45 frames per second with 0.1% lows, just short of that at 38 to 40. Overwatch is a very popular shooter from Blizzard Entertainment, and at 1080, it's actually capped at 300 frames per second max. So that is what we're seeing just about with every, every setup that we have here, about 290 to 300 FPS, and that's just because it's hitting the max. So there might be some variance there, but it doesn't, doesn't really matter at 1080. Which, which kind of sucks because I would be interested to see where it's actually capping off beyond that, but uh, you can't go beyond 300 with this game. At 1440 though, we start to see a little bit of a break from that. And here, interestingly, the uh, Ryzen CPUs are doing really well. Or, I mean, I, I don't wanna say really well, but they are marginally better performance than the Coffee Lake CPUs. So I thought that was something that was noteworthy. And it actually continued along in the 4K testing as well about 109 frames per second out of the 1800X and 1600X, whereas the Coffee Lakes were more down in the low hundreds. And finally, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. This is actually a fairly difficult game to benchmark simply because it's multiplayer, there's random starting locations. So, so just so you guys know, I was actually running these benchmarks in the starting location and that allowed me to be a lot more consistent. I did have to make sure that I was uh, restarting and joining a new game anytime I encountered rain or fog because that was definitely affecting the performance. But what I found was the numbers you're gonna see here are kind of a nice mid-range. When you're actually playing the game, you might see slightly higher frame rates than this when you're out in open fields where there's a lot less polygons. And you might see slightly lower frame rates than these if you're in a town or a city that has a lot more polygons. The Coffee Lake CPUs at 1080 though did show an advantage, so that is something worth pointing out. 1600X came in last with a score of 96 frames per second. Moving up to 1440, the numbers start to even out a little bit um, with both of our Coffee Lake CPUs scoring just shy of 90 frames per second. The Ryzen CPUs coming in in the low 80s. And then if we move over to 4K, uh, we see pretty much equivalence across the board. Here's where the game actually becomes majority uh, GPU model elect versus CPU. So we get the same frame rate no matter what platform we're testing on. And then I've got one last slide for you guys here. This is Power Draw, and as previously mentioned, the Coffee Lake CPUs seem to be idling uh, very, very nicely. Only about 49 watts drawn compared to the 70 or so from the Ryzen platforms. On average, though, we did see good Power Draw out of the Coffee Lake CPUs, about 358 watts, 335 watts on average from the 8700K and 8400K. And that was a little bit less than we were drawing from the 1800X and 1600X. So it is nice to know that uh, performance wise, these are keeping up with the Zen CPUs, which are known to be very power efficient. So I hope you guys have enjoyed those benchmarks because they took a freaking long time to run all of them, especially doing across all of those platforms. And I, I ran all of these tests fresh. I didn't use any old numbers or anything like that. So hit the thumbs up button if, if you like me running benchmarks, I guess. Um, anyway though, I chose the comparison CPUs that I chose. For instance, the 1800X, versus the 8700K, specifically because of the price. So the 1800X you can easily find for about 400 bucks right now. 8700K we're expecting to be 
just about that same price, maybe a little bit less. Uh, and the argument you could make there is there's other AMD Ryzen 8 core CPUs that you can get for as cheap as 300 bucks and you can overclock any of those to uh, perform pretty much equivalent with the 1800X anyway. Now the 1600X you can find for about 200 bucks and it is also a solid competitor for the i5-8400. Um, overall, I would say that Intel's single core performance advantage is definitely still there. Nothing has changed as far as going from Kaby Lake to Coffee Lake. The architecture is supposed to be pretty much the same apart from refinements and we don't necessarily refine, see refinements make significant uh, performance improvements unless it's just something like running at a higher frequency and that's pretty much what they're doing. So as might be expected in situations where single core performance uh, takes the lead, which it does in a lot of games and was demonstrated in at least some of the games that I uh, showed off today, you'll see better performance out of Intel's Coffee Lake CPUs. But all around, you can get very close to that performance with AMD's Ryzen lineup as well. So it does beg the question, what are you planning to do with the system that you're building? If you're planning to focus on gaming, and a lot of people are, and that was one of the big reasons to recommend a 7700K, even after the Ryzen stuff launched, was, well, that's probably gonna be your best bet. 8700K is now probably, for now, in the near future, gonna be clearly the go-to chip when it comes to building a mid to high-end gaming system. And the fact that you can now take advantage of six cores and 12 threads compared to four cores and eight threads that we've had prior to now means that games that take advantage of those threads are gonna benefit, and also it's gonna help with doing things like gaming and streaming at the same time. I didn't do gaming and streaming testing today, I also didn't do overclocking testing today, uh, mainly because I wanted to do that wide breadth of comparison versus several different CPU lineups, so that was my choice. I will uh, hopefully be coming back to those topics very soon as well. But that's pretty much all the time I have for today's video, you guys. I really hope you've enjoyed it. I need to get some sleep or something like that because I've had to delay Arctic Panther for, for like several days to take care of this, and, and that's that's been weighing on me. I want to get back to that very soon. But thanks so much again for watching this video, guys. If you did enjoy it, of course, hit the thumbs up button on your way out and leave a comment in the comment section. Let me know what you think about Intel's new CPU options. And also let me know if you're considering building a new system soon, what platform you think you're gonna go with. Are you gonna go with Intel's new mainstream, the Z370 stuff? Or are you gonna go with the AMD mainstream, like a X370 or a B350 and a Ryzen CPU? The choice is yours. I think if you're gonna do workstation stuff, the Ryzen CPUs are still gonna be the best bang for your buck and the option to go with. Um, but that's, that's all I should say for this video. Thanks again for watching, guys. We'll see you next time.